Amen. 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 Amen.
Vesso cala de rouba, 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 vesso cala de rouba. Desso gala de rouba, desso gala de rouba, desso gala de rouba. Desso gala de rouba, 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 desso gala de rouba. Maritime Valley, Maritime Valley. 
You are the Holy One. You are the Holy One, Jesus. Hey, Lord, we need you. We have only the Holy One, Jesus. That's why we are here this morning. We came to seek His face.
Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, like it is the name. Sometimes our experiences feel like you have left us, Father. 
But I pray that you help us to strengthen our mind, Father. Strengthen our mind and strengthen our spirit so that we would keep it fixed on the word. But it says that you have never left us nor forsaken us. Because your word says, even if our bed is in the hell, you will be there with us, Father. That's what the word says. Help us to trust that word of you. This is my tear. We're going to declare the words of God into our lives. We're going to speak that into our lives. Shall we rise up, anyone who's seated, and declare these promises into your life, into the lives of your family, into the lives of your loved ones? Declare this in faith. Repeat this after me. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. For righteousness is of the Lord. Whatever I do will prosper. For I am like a tree that's planted by the rivers of water. The spirit of truth abides in me and teaches me all things. And it guides me into all truth. I let the peace of God rule in my heart. And I refuse to worry about anything. I will not let the word of God depart from before my eyes. For it is life to me. I have found it. It is health and healing to all my flesh. So I say God is on my side. God is in me now. Who can be against me? He has given unto me all things that pertains to this life and godliness. Therefore I'm a partaker of his divine nature. Shall we give God the glory this morning? Hallelujah. We may be seated. <coughs> I'll quickly run the announcements of the same that we've had last week. Uh, we have the premarital camp on the 14th and the 15th of August. For anyone who is yet to get married, please go attend that. Uh, you can take the address if, if it comes up here. Otherwise, you can just take the address from the pastors. It is in a place which is close by. Uh, if you're getting married in the next five years, this is a place for you to go and attend. Because like we've been sharing, it is after, being after the decision of being born again, this is the next most important decision you can make in your life. So go and prepare 14th and the 15th of August. It is 1,500 rupees, which even includes an accommodation if you intend to stay there, and food, materials, everything. So I can tell you that's pretty cheap. Uh, so go be a part of that. Uh, we're also looking for uh, people in our uh, church working teams. Uh, we're looking for people in the media team, uh, someone who could come edit the videos, who could work on the lyrics and things like that. And uh, we can even train you if you're interested and if you're committed to this cause, we can even train you. So we have Brother Chaitanya who will do that. So if you're interested, please contact uh, Brother Chaitanya. If you can't see him, just come to the sound room and ask for them and, and they'll take you from there. Uh, also, we're looking for people in the worship team, so if you're interested, please come contact me. If you're interested in being part of the uh, uh, Usher team, please contact Pastor Stephen. Uh, those are the announcements that we have for, for this week. Uh, should we rise up and get ready to give our best to the Lord?
God is good. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Amen. So once again, it's our privilege and a pleasure to be with you this morning, uh, to worship God along with you. And for those that are watching us from around the world, we, we welcome you as well. You're part of us. We pray that God will speak to you. Amen. Uh, is there anybody here for the first time at Zion? Anybody visiting for the first time? Just slip up your hand for a moment. Anybody for the first time? Yeah, we have one. Can we just welcome her? God bless you. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I just want to thank you right now for this moment. We want to commit this moment into your hand, Father. We just thank you that even during the time of our worship, during the time of our giving, we thank you that you were honored and glorified in our life. And we just want to commit even the time that we spend right now at your presence receiving the word. We pray that your spirit will speak into our lives. Let it speak into our situations let it, and let it take root in our hearts. And we pray, Lord, that the word will go forth and will not return void. And let it accomplish whatever you will send it out to do this morning. I thank you, Lord, that you've given us the privilege to receive from you. And we give you the glory for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you can turn with me to the book of Matthew and chapter 6. Everyone doing okay? There's like two people. Yes, amen. Okay, uh, I'm in the book of Matthew and chapter 6. It's a very common uh, reading. But if we can all read this together from verses um, 25 to 34. If you're there, say amen. Okay. Can we read together verses 25 to 34, Matthew chapter 6 at the count of three? Are you ready? One, two, three. Therefore, I say to you. What's your thought? What did you put on? It is not life more than food and body, more than clothing. Look at the birds of the air, for they need the soul. It's like, you know, when we start, uh, start a race, you're full of energy. You run the first one minute and then you die. It sounded like that. Okay, can we continue? Verses 26 onwards. Look at the birds of the air, for they need the soul, no reap, no gather. Now we have God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven. Will he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore, do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? 
For after all these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Oh, you can breathe now. <laughs> Amen. I want to just continue um, on the message that we, we spoke last week. Uh, we titled it Minefield. And uh, if you want to put a title to it, you can say Minefield Part 2. I was praying and saying, God, you know, is there something new, something different? Uh, but for some reason, God just said, I want you to just continue on this topic. So I said, okay, whatever you, whatever you want to do. Amen? Um, because I believe that the renewing of the mind, the mind, the battle of the mind is a process. And just sometimes hearing just a little will not be enough to equip us to go through that change. So I just want to spend a little bit more time on that subject. Uh, so I'm going to take it a little slow, so please do bear with me. Uh, but we'll try to finish it on time. If not, Anson will uh, come up on the stage and take the mic. Then we know that it's done. Amen. Hallelujah. You know, when I was watching uh, National Geography, uh, you have these wildlife episodes. Amen. So when you see, when I see the lion, you know, and its and its might and its strength and uh, its teeth and its roar, uh, you know, it, 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 something about that just commands majesty, just commands respect. And then when you look at um, the elephant in its in its mass and in its height and in its strength, and then you look at different other. Uh, Animals, for example, you look at a cheetah, who's very quick, extremely fast. So it does not matter how loud the lion can be or how ferocious the lion can be, but if the lion can't catch the cheetah, then it's no use. Amen? And I just think about that, and I see that, and God, is sure, God just spoke to me, and he said that these are the strengths that I gave it to survive in what they do. So when we get caught up with like, oh, the majesty of the lion, the roar of the lion, the bite of the lion, or the speed of the cheetah, but that is essential for its survival. And then I look back and then I say, okay, so what is it that you've given us? If you look at the attribute of a lion or the elephant or a cheetah, the word about us. And God just showed me that what I've given you as a strength is your mind. Are you with me? And that's why the human race is so, do, so more accomplished because we can think, we can act, we can create stuff. So the, the, one that, the thing that he has given us as our attribute is a mind that sets us apart from the rest. And that's why I want to spend just a little bit more time on this subject because many of us are, and we don't have the revelation of, really what's going on in our life and how we are living in this world. Amen? So I'm just going to take you through this for a moment. The few things that God spoke to me right up till this morning, I didn't have a message. I said, God, so how are you going to bring this up? And this, so God just gave me this message in the last couple of hours. So I'm processing it at the same time as I'm speaking to you. Amen? Because to be transformed, we all say that we are transformed, but, you know, we are, we are in the image of Christ, we've been transformed to the image of Christ, we are transformed to the reflection of Christ, so to be transformed or to be like the image of Christ, we need to think like he thinks, we need to act like he acts, we need to, we need to understand his ways, we need to understand his thoughts, we need to understand his plans. Hallelujah. And that can only happen from a renewed mind. You cannot live a renewed life if you don't have a renewed mind. We all thank God and we all praise and we all clap our hands and we say thank you God for, for renewing our life. Thank you God for saving our life. Thank you for restoring. Thank you for this abundant life. And the reason why we're not able to live what he has given to us so freely is because you cannot live a renewed life without a renewed mind. And that's where a lot of the church I believe is stuck because we don't want to take the time into really getting into the word of God to renew our mind 
so that we can live this renewed life that he has given us. That's why we continue to live like the world, although we say that we are not like that. Are you with me? And, then, and that's the confusion that the world also has, saying that you say you're a Christian, but your lifestyle is just like mine. What's the difference? You do like what I do, you worry about what I worry about, you know, you're, you're stressed about what I'm stressed about, you run after what I run after, you know, so what's the difference? And the reason why we are not able to bring out the difference is because our mind itself is not renewed, and that's why we cannot live that standard to show it as a testimony. Can I get an amen? The word renew is to, is to make new again, which means it was, and it's being made new again. And to bring back what was lost. And I go back, if it is to be made new again, it takes us back to Genesis. In the first creation of Adam, the Adam was created and probably is considered the most wise of all created humans. Amen? And Adam, the Bible says, you know, God brought things to him and says, now Adam, you name it. Whatever you called it, it will be. And he named the vegetation. He named the wildlife. He named everything that he's seen. He had the wisdom, although he never had a pre existing wisdom of what it was. It's not like he studied about it and said, okay, now that I've studied about it, now let me, now let me give it a name. Are you with me? So he already had a knowledge and a wisdom that was pre-existing the creation of or the experience of that. So when we look at that and we look at you know, what happened with man and how man fell, and it takes me back to the time uh, when you look at Genesis chapter 3, when you look at Eve you know, having that encounter with Satan. And, uh, and, and uh, Satan was talking to Eve, and the Bible says that, I think in verses 6, I think I wrote it down, it says, when the woman saw the tree was good for food, and it was pleasant to the eye, and the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took its fruit and ate, and she also gave it to her husband. They were already wise, they already had the favor and the wisdom of God, but if Satan can, can keep you in deception, of what you, do, what you have, then you will never realize the power of what you have. If you don't realize what you have, you will never know that you have it to be able to use it. Are you with me? Amen? So Satan will always play with words. He'll always bring thoughts into your mind and get you to, 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 uh, to be deceived with what you have. And most Christians, the reason why we are deceived, why we are broken, why we are frustrated, why we are worried and anxious and stressed is because we don't have a revelation of what we have. And what Satan will try to do is to magnify what you think you don't have to make it more real in your life. Amen? And he will feed on that insecurity, that, that misconception or that deception that he has planted in your mind and he'll start feeding into it and then you will start reacting by your fear of what you don't have. Am I, are you with me so far? That's why the Bible says that my people perish because of knack, lack of knowledge. Amen? But it's not knowledge in the written form, but it's knowledge in the revealed form. A lot of people can have knowledge in the written form. But unless the written form becomes a revealed form, it has no power. Are you with me? So a lot of people can get stuck into the practice of reading the word of God without taking time in meditating on the Word of God, because in meditation comes revelation. And if the Word is not revealed to you, then it will not have the power to manifest in you. Are you with me? So a lot of people can say that, I don't understand, I'm reading my Bible, I've, I, I've done it two, three times, ten times, twenty times, three times in a year, all of that stuff, but you don't see the fruit in their life, because for them the knowledge is still in the written form. But unless the word of God becomes in the revealed form, will you have the power to operate in its revelation? Okay? All okay so far? Okay. Amen. That is why, you know, when you say that if you want to empower a nation, if you want to empower somebody, what do you need to do for them? Give them an education. Anybody with no education really is, empo is not powered. So that's why you can keep them as slaves. You can keep them in, in their standard. But once you open up education in them, once you open up their mind, then they start desiring, then they start achieving, they start striving for higher. That is why even as a church, you know, the reason why we do this 
uh, the children's scholarship that we talk about. And most of you are wondering, like, what is that? You know, I can spend that money on coffee. What we do, the vision that we have is that this small 250 rupees a month at least pays for one month's fees, or at least towards that. And when you empower a child to, in education, then you're giving them the chance to, to, to um, affect their environment. Because most kids, most children, become the product of their environment. Are you with me? So if my environment is broken, if my, if, if my family has never been educated, if my father was always a drunkard, never had a job, or you know, had one of, these, one of the low jobs, and I've never had an education, then I become the product of the environment that I've grown up in. Amen? And that's why you see a trend. You see that although you try to get rid of the slums, but you can never get rid of the person. So they still continue to operate in that mentality because that's the environment that they're nurtured and grown in, and that's the environment that they will operate in. So what we, want, what we, what we do is, and the reason why we started the scholarship, I think now it's about, how many years? 10, 12 years or something like that. Uh, I forget the, the number, but it's quite high. Is that, you know, we give them a chance to, to, to come up in life. And most of these children that we have sponsored for so many years have gone on to do college, have gone on to do their masters, some are doing their medicals now, some are doing post-graduation, some are working. And it's an opportunity that they would not have had if we had not had people who come and said, you know what, let me, let me sponsor, let me sponsor. It's only 250 a month. You know, that's, that's hardly, a price of one kg of tomatoes is what, 80, 60 rupees, 80 rupees or whatever. At one time, the price of dal went to 200 rupees a kg. Uh, but we don't want to spend that on a child's education. Because we, you don't understand that when you invest in somebody, you know, it's not for your, your benefit, but what that person will become is the fruit of your investment. Are you with me? Amen. So, that's why God has got this em emphasis on renewing your mind. You've got to renew your mind. You've got to renew your mind. Because that's the only way you will get out of your environment. Amen. So, in order to shape you are thinking, many times God will move you from your environment. If you look at the life of Abraham, before he could start working in Abraham's life, the first thing that he said is what? Get out of your father's house. Get out of where you are. Because I need to work with your mind. I need to change some things. I need to change your thinking. I need to challenge your thinking. Once David had his battles, you know, the, you know we read a story. He never went back to his father's house. But then he started growing up in the palace. Because he had to be trained on how to think like a king, how to act like a king. Are you with me? Amen? So even you look at Joseph, he went through what he went through, but because God had to f you know, work with his mind, work in, work in his heart. And you even look at our lives. Many of my African brethren and sisters, I keep, I keep saying this to myself and I keep telling them as well. God has moved you from your environment so that you can affect your environment when you get back. But as long as you are stuck in your environment, you become just the product of your environment and you will not have the power to influence your environment. But once your mind has been renewed, once your outlook has changed, then you can go back with a new vision and a new, and a new uh, revelation. Amen? So a lot, of, uh, a lot of my African brothers and sisters, I love you very much, but they always want to go to the USA and Canada and all of those places. I, I urge you and I encourage you, God has taken you out so that when you go back, you bless your nation. A lot of the African nations are under such poverty, such, such control, such oppression, and the people are not being able to rise up because they, their mind has not been renewed. So they're living under the system, but they're not willing to change the system. Am I saying something to you? I was so surprised, you know, when Brother Anson and me were talking about I was so surprised that the second poorest nation in the world is Congo. I was so surprised. And I said, when you look at them, you will think that they're the richest nation because they're dressed like the richest nation. But I believe that, you know, that all these, uh, if you look at, I think, the top, bottom 25, majority of, not, if not all of it, is African nations because they use their... Um, Lack of exposure or lack of, of, of whatever, I, can, I can't get up the word, to keep them under oppression. And that's Satan's tactic always, to, keep, to use your ignorance to keep you under oppression. Amen? 
So that's why this entire focus on you've got to renew your mind, because only when you renew your mind, only when you start thinking different and you start acting different according to the Word of God, then that's when your results will be different. Because I think, what is the definition of, of stupid, I think? What is it? Idiocy or stupid is to do the same thing over again and expect a different result. You're doing the same thing, you get different result. You do exactly the same thing, you will get the same result. You can't do the same thing and expect a different result. Are you with me? So you are expecting something at a different realm, but you're still operating on this, on this level. Your, your mind is still like this, your actions are still like this, your decisions are still in this realm, but you're expecting to receive something higher. And God said, that can't work. You've got to renew your mind because you've got to think on a different level. You've got to understand my standards of my kingdom because my kingdom is not of this world. It is higher than this world, but my kingdom can influence this world. So if you don't understand how my kingdom operates, you will never be able to operate as an agent of my kingdom in this world. Amen? Hallelujah. That's why the Bible says, that you've got to continue to renew your mind. You're not of this world. I need you to understand you're in this world, but you're not of this world. So you've got to get a revelation of that. If I'm not in this world, then how do I operate in this world? And th that's why this entire emphasis, and I want to spend more time on this because you need to get this. You need to open your eyes and see this. The Bible says, what does light got to do with darkness? You know that scripture? What does light got to do with darkness? And he's always challenging us to come out from where we are so that we can become who we are. I want you to come out of the world system so that I can build you up to who you are. I need you, I need you to come out of your environment that defines you so that I can, I can build you up to who you are. And who are you? You are the son and daughter of God. Amen? So with that position come certain responsibilities and how to operate in that position. It's not like I'm a son and daughter and walk around like that. Your position needs to influence. Hallelujah. So, if, so for me to get you to who you are, I need to get you out from where you are. And sometimes he will, he will, he will unruffle your, your environment that you are so comfortable in and get you out so that he can do whatever he needs to do in your life. And this reminds me, some time ago, I think when we were at Sister Menezes' house, this reminded me of a scripture um, when we're talking about the eagles and how the eagles un unruffle the nest. When you, when you think about the eagles, it's such a majestic bird and we have so many explanations of it. You know, when it builds its nest, it surrounds its nest, you know, high in the mountain, so that's away from most of the prey. And it has, you know, the branches sticking out of the nest. And it sticks out of the nest to prevent other animals who live in that realm to be able to enter into the nest. It's a protection. Amen? But in time, once the eagles start hatching and developing a little, then the, the mother eagle unruffles the nest. What it does, it starts pulling out twigs from inside the nest to start pointing inside. Why? Because I need you to get out. If you don't get out of your nest, you will die in your nest. Are you with me? Amen? So it's no longer you, me protecting you from your environment. It's me trying to channel, channelize you to your destiny. As long as an eagle doesn't fly, it will not function in the fullness of who it is. Amen? So it unruffles the nest. It gets them uncomfortable because if they try to be comfortable, you have a, a, you have a, a twig that will poke it and make it move again. And then it will push you off the cliff. And the eagle does not know how to fly. But the mother pushes it off the cliff. But in the process of it falling, it identifies who it is. In the process of the descent, it, un it identifies that it can fly. It can start flapping its wings. And then it finds out. But when you look at it, it's such a cruel act for a mother to push off its child across the cliff. And sometimes we think, oh, why do you allow this to come into our life? Why do you allow this to happen in our lives? And sometimes he says, I need to allow you because I need to push you off your comfort area. And in the process of, 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 of the journey, you will come to realize who you really are. Amen? And the Bible says the, the eagle hovers over the, the, the bird as it's falling, which means to saying that, I got you. I will never let you fall further than where you're going to hit yourself and die. So that's why the mother eagle, although it pushes off, it still remains with the eaglet until it learns how to fly. So if it falls too far, it's not flying, it will come back down again and pick it up. 
that's how God works in our lives. He will never leave you, no for. But when situation comes, we always just think God is forsaken, God is forsaken, God is forsaken. But he's saying that, you know, in the journey of, of, of what you think that you're going through, you will rediscover who you really are. And even in that moment, although you don't see me, I've got you. I've got you. Amen? And once the eagle starts to fly, then the eagle can start providing for itself. Many a times we are so comfortable with church and with God that we always want God to provide, God to provide, God to provide. But the eagle, once it learns out who it is, it knows how to go and provide for itself. It reminds me, I'm, I'm, I'm just fast forwarding in my message. It reminds me of uh, the children of Israel. When we look at the miracles of God, it's like, wow, you know how we removed them from Egypt, the mighty hand of God, we're so impressed, and the Red Sea, and the quail, and the manna, and the rock, and the water from the rock, and we say like, oh my God, this is so amazing. But if you just dissect these miracles, if you look at Egypt, he used his miracle and his power to redeem you. He used his miracles and his power in the desert to sustain you. You will never see the repeat in the promised land. Because in the promised land, my miracles is to elevate you and to advance you, not to sustain you. Are you with me? You, in the desert, you need the manna, you need the water, you need the protection, you need all of that. Why? Because I need to sustain you. But once you get to the promised land, I no longer am I'm, I'm, I'm not focused on sustaining you, I'm focused on elevating you. Amen? That's why when the battle came, it was because of the victory that is ahead, not because it's an oppression. Are you still with me? Amen? But a lot of Christians, we want the miracles to sustain us. Provide for me, 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 provide for me. Lord, I have this problem, that problem, this problem, that problem, this problem. So we're still in the, in the sustaining mode. But a few people, when they see God work, it's for their elevation. Are you with me? And all of them can be at the same church at the same time listening to the same messages. Amen? There's a difference between the redemption time and the restoration time. If it's redeemed but not restored then it is not efficient. Am I saying something? If I buy something which is broken, I've redeemed it. But it's not functional. Amen? It's not efficient. Maybe it's functioning to a certain capacity, but not efficient. But when I restore it, then it becomes efficient. So many people can be uh, functional, but not efficient. Are you still with me? So redemption is to make you functional, but restoration is to make you effective. I've redeemed you and we're happy about that and we like to stay in that, in that bucket. But when God wants to move you, you're like, no, no, I like to be where I am. I like to be where I am. And we'll always be stuck in trying to get God to do things for us when God is trying to get you to move to a level where you can start doing things for the kingdom. Oh, Jesus, help me this morning. Amen? When we think about the story of the prodigal son, we know the story. The boy ran away. He was arrogant. He was reckless. You know, he was uh, proud and all of that. He ran away, took the money, spent it. We know the story. And then he came back. In his mind, he was like, if only my father says, okay, you're forgiven. Make me a servant. I'm okay. Just redeem me. I'm okay. But that's not the father's heart. Can you turn to somebody and say, that's not the father's heart. He's not just interested in redeeming you. His goal is to restore you. Amen? When the action of putting the sandals on the feet and the cloak on, on, the, on, the, on the boy was redemption. But when he put his signet ring on his finger, that was restoration. I'm redeeming you, restoring you to your position as a son. Are you with me? So when God working in our lives, he didn't die and shed his blood so that you can just live redeemed and happy about that. 
but, if, but he wants to move you to being restored so that you can function in the position of your calling, so that you can function in the position of your anointing, so that you can shake the world, so that you can be an influence in the kingdom. We all say that, you know, we are part of the kingdom and he's going to use us to expand the kingdom, but you can only expand the kingdom if you're efficient in God's hand. Amen? So he will take you through a breaking process and he will take you through a molding process. But when we are so, when we, when we just give up in the breaking process, we will never get to see the fulfillment of the molding process. Are you with me? Because breaking is, is, is hard. It's painful. Amen? If you take an old building and I want to make it a mansion, I can't construct on it. I got to break it down. I got to lay a new foundation so that I can build. Are you with me? But if the, if the house had a say, if it had its own thing, it says, you know what, I'm happy being broken, I'm happy being like I am, I don't, I don't want to be that. And that's unfortunately the story of many lives. We are happy being what we are, and we really are not interested in becoming who we are. But theologically, we like to, we like to say it. I am a son of God, I am a child of God, I am blessed, I am favored, I am all of that. We like to say it, we like to think it, but we don't really don't like to go through the process that makes us it. I've got very quiet this morning. All okay this morning? Okay. Coming back to Matthew in chapter 6, and, and Jesus now is talking to the disciples, and he says, do not worry, do not worry. Look at the lilies, look at the birds, do not worry about tomorrow. And Jesus is saying, do not worry, don't, and I think the KGV version says, lay no thought of these things. Don't even think about these things. Take no thought because your father knows. It comes back again to your father. Your father knows. Why do you want to stress about this when your father knows? Amen? And many of us, we don't have a revelation of, of God's heart and, and the father's, and that's why we go through the stress. What's going to happen about tomorrow? How many of you, me included, I know, have stayed up many nights, you know, uh, stressed, worried, ang anxious, Say, what's going to happen? How is this situation going to turn? God, how am I going to pay my bill? You know, what's going to happen with my children? What's going to happen to my family? How many of you have gone through processes like that? So that's great that you know how to meditate. Amen. <laughs> that's why the Bible says, meditate on my word day and night. So, if you, so you know how to meditate because we do that very well with, with, all the, with all the other stuff. Now you just have to change the topic of your meditation. Instead of meditating on these things which you don't have the power to change or to control, why don't you meditate on the one that has the power to change your tomorrow? Why don't you, why don't you meditate on the one that has the power to change futures, to change life, to transform situations, to move mountains, to make ways? Why don't you change your focus of your meditation on the one that is able rather than stressing on you who is unable to do anything about tomorrow. And that's what Jesus is saying. You're worried about something which you have no power to influence. Because when you wake up in the morning, you don't know how the day is going to pan out. So why don't you trust the one that knows? That's why we say he's our Alpha and our Omega. He's the beginning and the... He's the author of our faith. He's the finisher of our faith. We say the words, but we don't have a revelation of the words. Because if we have a revelation of what we're saying, then we understand that, yes, he's not only my God of my today, he's my God of my tomorrow. And he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, and he's ever faithful. If he sustained me today, he will sustain me tomorrow. If he's made a way today, he will make a way tomorrow. Amen? But we get into this, this, this uh, world of, of Worrying and being anxious, well, how will my children grow up? How will this happen? What will my parents say? What will my husband say? What will my wife say? What will my girlfriend say? What will my boyfriend say? You know, what will happen to my business? What will happen to all of that? And, God, and Jesus is saying, you know, why do you worry about things which you cannot change? The Father knows. And he comes back to that. The Father knows. He knows what you need, when you need. And he knows how he will provide it to you. Amen? Because if you're going to take the stress on you, then what you're saying is, I, do, I trust you for my eternity, but I don't trust you for my now. Amen? 
I trust you, yes, I gave my life to you, you're going to, you know, you're going to give me heaven and I'm going to be saved, all of that, eternity is taken care of, but I don't trust you for my life right now. So I now take the responsibility on me to figure out how my life will be. That sounded like a poem. Amen. Hallelujah. So that's why God is always continuing to, to motivate us and says, transform your mind. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you can prove what is good and, and, and acceptable, in the, acceptable word of the God. Meditate on my word day and night and whatever you put your hand to shall prosper. So many scriptures, so many promises. And God is saying, I, it's good that you know the promises, but I want you to meditate on it so that it becomes revelation. Because once it becomes revelation, then it starts affecting your thinking. It starts affecting your decision. Amen? And you are the product of your decisions. Hallelujah. What you have, what the decisions that you have made in your past, you are the product of it now. So what decisions you make now, you will be the product of it tomorrow. So when you meditate on the word of God, when you get a revelation of the word of God, when you, when you let the word of God start affecting your thinking, start affecting your ways, then it will start creating your life. It will start making your life or forming your life or bringing it into the will of God. Everybody prays and says, God, what is your will in my life? What is your will in my life? Everybody has that prayer. God, I want you to show me what is your will in my life? What should I be? What should I do? Amen? So we, we trust God for the answer to that question, but we don't trust him in the way that he will bring that answer to pass. Are you, are you okay? Oh man, I get some water. You can get some water as well. Hey Amen. So why worry? Because worry will cause fear. It, the cause of your fear, the cause of your anxiety, the cause of your worry is all rooted in the ignorance of tomorrow. And you, and you don't have to worry about tomorrow because the Father knows. Amen? The Father knows. And you've got to keep encouraging yourself. My father knows. My father knows about tomorrow. So let me trust him because he's the same. He's ever faithful. Hallelujah. That's why I think we used to sing a song. You don't sing that anymore. Turn your eyes on Jesus. How, how, how many of you know that song? Yeah. I, I, my voice is very bad. But can you sing it? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look for his wonderful and the Will he goes in the light of turn your eyes upon Jesus and the things of this world will go strangely. We get caught up in the song and sometimes we miss the meaning. And that's why, you know, when we when we worship, we don't want to get caught up in the music and caught up with you know with the, the, the way it's sung and miss the meaning of what God is trying to reveal through the song. Many times we sung the song, we used to sing the song so many times. Amen? And he's saying, if you turn your eyes upon Jesus, then the things of this world will go strangely dim. Strangely as in you don't understand, but it will lose its power. Because you're focused on a higher power. Amen? When you're, when you're focused on a solution, then the problem doesn't bother you. Oh, Jesus. Amen. Okay. Fear. When you look at fear, I have some time. Okay. Fear is rooted in a lie. Amen. And when you believe the lie, you empower the liar. Are you with me? Just like fear, you have truth. Yeah, just like how you have lie, you have truth. Like how fear is rooted in lie, you also, and lie has a source, truth has a source. I think that's why even last week I mentioned you always need to spend time getting to the source of where it came from. Because if you believe in the words of someone, then you're trusting the one who said it. Are you with me? And we gave you the example of the marriage vows. The reason why the marriage vows are so powerful is because you believe in the one that gave you the vow. It's not just the words that they say, but who said it. Amen? So when you look at lies and truth, you know, you have got to look at the origin. And I said that if you don't have something to measure it, then you won't know what is lie and what is truth. And why sometimes is the, word, the church is so broken is because they don't have a revelation of what is lie and what is truth. That's why the Bible says in the last days, many, the elite 
shall be deceived. Amen? You can get caught up in church so much that you will lose revelation of truth. And when you use that, lose the revelation of truth, then I will use your ignorance to trap you. Are you with me? And I can take scriptures out of its context and throw it at you and make you believe what I want you to believe. Are you with me? That's why when you meditate on the word of God, you spend time in understanding what is the context of what God is saying. And if you take a scripture out of context, you can root it the way you want to root it. And that's why there's deception in the church, because people are not grounded. We are happy with the Sunday morning one hour message, you know, scriptures thrown here and there. Oh, praise God, move ahead. And you don't see it manifest in your life. Because, and, and sometimes you understand it in a certain way. And instead of being a blessing to you, it can be a burden in your life. And you don't understand how why it works. It's because you are not rooted in the word of God. When you have a revelation of the word of God, then you'll be able to, to dece- decipher what is truth and what is being exaggerated. Exaggerated truth is lie. It doesn't make it half truth. It makes it lie. Amen? And lies feed on fear. And fear will prevent you from operating in faith. Amen? Truth feeds on faith and, f- and lies feed on fear. Because if I get you to operate in fear, then I restrict you from operating in faith. And if I, and I get you to operate in fear, then I get you to operate in the natural. Well, faith helps you operate in the supernatural. So for me to prevent you from operating in the supernatural, I got to keep you in the natural. And to keep you in the natural, I got to use fear. And a lot of people in the things that we do, even in church, is we operate out of fear and not of faith. Amen? So sometimes, can I, can I be real with you? Okay. There's like one person, other ones are like, sometimes, you know, when we look at church, and we look at, you know, some churches which are growing like in thousands and thousands, then we start thinking, oh my God, you know, churches are growing so big. Our church is not growing that big. Let us do this. Let us do that. Let us create this program. Let us do that. Let us do that. Our, our, our motive of reaching the people is based on our fear and not faith. Are you with me? So you can do the things of God, but in fear and not faith. And then you wonder why it's not working. Amen? I need a breakthrough, so I'm going to, I'm going to fast and pray for one week or for 40 days. And you go through all of that and you get nothing. Because more, the, 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 the motive of you doing what you're doing is, 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 is yeah, Anchored or based in fear and not on faith. And anything which is not of faith, the Bible says, is. And we still want God to answer it. Amen? God loves you. Hallelujah. Amen? And I've seen this many times. Fear will keep you on your knees, seeking God for what you want. But faith will elevate you, seeking God for who He is. Are you with me? Both of them are seeking God. But for the reason of seeking God is so different. Fear will keep you on your knees seeking God for what you want, what you need. But faith will keep you or elevate you seeking God for who He is. And when you get a revelation of who He is, though they, those that know their God shall do. Amen. They are the ones that will operate in the promised land while the others still struggle in the wilderness. They need God's miracles to sustain them, while the others need seeking God's miracles to elevate them. Hallelujah. Okay. And it, it brings me back, uh, you know, on Tuesday we have this prayer, and I encourage you, come, it's at 7.30 in the evening. It's a wonderful time of prayer, and we spend some time in the Word. And this week while we were talking about something, we, we, uh, Brother Anson brought up Ephesians chapter 1, verses 18. Uh, where is that? Can we just turn there? Ephesians chapter 1, verses 18. We're going to close in a few minutes. It'll be okay. Don't worry. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his mighty power. And while we were talking about it, we've seen that, you know, Paul, when I used to look at it before, some time ago, 
I always thought that Paul was, was, was trying to talk to you about your spirit. I pray that your spirit is enlightened so that you can see. Our spirit is enlightened. But as you go into it, we understand that when we are born again, your spirit, the Bible said, is already quickened. It's already enlightened. It already knows the things of God. It already knows the ways of God. It already knows the purpose of God in your life. So it's not a problem with your spirit. But Paul here is trying to talk to you about your mind. I pray that the eyes of your understanding will be enlightened. That you will know what is the hope of his calling in your life. What are the riches of his glory and the inheritance of his saints. And the exceeding great power. So what Paul is trying to say is, I want your, your mind to get a revelation of what you have. Because many times our focus is on what we don't have. And what we lack. Amen. But he said, I want you to get a revelation of what you have. And when I look at it, and I look at fear, and I look at the things of the world, Satan will use the external to try to influence you. Amen? But God uses your spirit, your internal, to try to transform you. Amen? So Satan will use lies and fear to try to get a stronghold in your mind to control your decisions, to control your thinking, because as a man thinks, so is he. Are you with me? Amen? But God uses faith, God uses his spirit, truth, to speak into your spirit to bring revelation and transformation in your mind. So you're not transformed by what you read, you're transformed by the revelation through your spirit. Amen? Of what you read. That's how the word, the written word, becomes a revealed word. Satan will use the external forces to suppress you, but God will use your spirit to elevate you. So what Paul is saying is, I pray that your, your, mind, your, 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 your mind gets enlightened so that you will know. So that as you feed your spirit and the word works in your spirit, you will get a revelation of who you are and what you can do and what God has done for you. That you will understand your purpose. Everybody is asking this question, what is my purpose on this earth? What is my purpose of living? What is my purpose of life? If you want to know that answer, you've got to get your answers already here. You've got to get a revelation of it. That your mind has to be open so that you can see it. Everybody wants to know, God, what does you have in store for me? What is, what's in store for me? Your answer is already there. And as, as he said, that your eyes of your understanding be enlightened, that you know the hope of his calling, and the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and the exceeding greatness of his power towards us, who believe. If you get an understanding of the power that is in you, the same power the Bible says that has risen Christ from the grave, if you understand, if you get a revelation of that power, then you will get a revelation of the verse where we say that he that is in me is greater than he that is in the... Amen? But the verses will not make sense if you don't get a revelation of it. And the only way you get a revelation is to immerse yourself in the word of God and say, God, help me understand you better. Help reveal yourself to me better. Help me to know you better. Amen? Hallelujah. All okay? Amen. So, as we read the same scripture in Matthew, just before that it says that, um, let me just turn to that. This is, a, this is a really good verse. Verse 22, the lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore the eye is good, the whole body body will be full of light but if your eye is bad then the whole body will be full of darkness this is just before he talked about do not worry about this do not worry about the lilies do not worry about the you know look at the lilies look at the birds they don't worry why are you worrying just a few verses before that he talks about the eye and the light and it reminds me of another scripture he says that my word is a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path so if your eye is fixed on the light then your whole body is enlightened amen but if your eye is fixed on darkness, darkness is what? The absence of light. Amen? That's why it says darkness and light cannot coexist because wherever the light is, darkness cannot be. Amen? The definition of darkness is no light. And the presence of light removes darkness. So if, the presence, if there is an absence of the word, then your eyes is fixed on darkness. And when your eyes is fixed on darkness, then your whole being is filled with darkness, which means that you have no sight of who you are and where you're going in life. Amen? And it's very difficult for you to trust someone who does not know where they're going. Hallelujah. And this is especially for young people who want to get married. If you're going to give your life to somebody and they don't know where they're going and who they are, then you'll be as lost as them. 
All those who are married have to just live in faith now. But, <laughs> but those who are not married, please make a note. Amen? That's why marriage is built on trust and understanding, not just a fuzzy feeling. Amen? You've got to know who you're getting married to. What, is, what are they doing? What, what is God in their life? How much do they love God? What are they, you know, you've got to build on knowledge. Trust is built on knowledge and experience. And if you don't do that, then you're as lost. And then you'll be wondering why I married you in the first place. I don't know why I married you. I don't know why I married you. So that argument will never come up. For those who have that argument, you know what I'm talking about. But for, <laughs> for the others, you know, praise God for that. That's my cue. Okay. Amen. So I urge you, as the Bible says, what does light got to do with darkness? Darkness cannot prevail where there is light. And my word is a light unto your path. My word is a light. It will reveal to you every step of the way. Every step that you need to take, my word will give you clarity. My word will give you vision on how you need to go, where you need to go. But if you have no vision, then you are lost. Amen? If, and you will be stuck where you are and frustrated that you will never become who you are. A lot of people are frustrated in church because they see so many people growing, so many people rising up. Those are all the wilderness kind of people, you know. They get frustrated because they're only seeking God for what they can get. But those in the promised land are seeking God as they move forward. Amen? Because the battle will, will, will enable you for, the, for what is ahead. In order for you to conquer, you've got to win. Amen? And His miracle power helps you to overcome so that you can move forward. So those of us who are stuck in seeking God, say, God, please do this, please do this, please do this. God is saying, I want you to renew your mind. If not, you will never realize the power that works in you. You will never realize who you are and what you are meant to be and what you are meant to do. And you'll always be stuck on receiving and never be in a position to give. Amen? That's the difference between a selfish person. We always want and we're not effective because we never, we never have the heart to give because we never are full enough. I have this problem and that problem and this problem and that problem. God help me, God help me, God help me. You will never be a, an agent of change if you're still an agent that requires, please help me, please help me, please help me. And God is saying, I want to, I want to get you out. I took you out of Egypt. I took you from your bondage. I took you from your chains. I took you from the one that oppressed you, the one that, that kept you. I took you, I broke you from all of that with my blood. I saved you. I brought you through the wilderness, but I don't want you to die in the wilderness. Many of that generation, they never saw the promised land. The Bible said that their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. But there's a generation that entered into the promised land. Which generation are you? The one that will enter into your promised land or the one that will die in the wilderness. The ones that died in the wilderness, they were always murmuring and complaining and finding fault and anxiety and worry and all of that stuff. But there's a few people who says, though they may be giants, we can take the land. Though there may be adversities, we can overcome. Though there might be difficulties, we shall be conquerors. But there's some that will look at your situation and say, no, 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 we can't. We are, we are grasshoppers. They are giants. No, 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 we can't. We can't. We can't. And they said, that why, why do you get afraid? If God be for you, who can be against you? If God says go, then he's already made a way. But that is the difference that you see in people. Some that will be content to die in the wilderness and some that will push on into the promised land. Are you with me? The question that you need to ask yourself, which generation do you belong to? Which generation do you belong to? Where fear will draw you to your knees to seek God for what you want or will elevate you to seek God for who He is. And I just remember back, I know, I know I'm repeating a lot of things, but I remember back again in that, in that message when, Peter, when, God, when Jesus spoke to Peter and he said that 
who, say, who, who do you say I am? And Peter said that you are Christ, the son of the living God. And he said that, Peter, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And upon this rock will I build my church. Upon this revelation will I build my church. The revelation of who Christ is. The church is who we are. When you are built on who Christ is, then the gates of hell cannot prevail against you. Hallelujah. And he says, I want you to get that revelation. If you get a revelation that I am Christ, I am God, if you get a revelation of who I am, then you will be the church. And though the gates of hell will come against you, they cannot prevail against you. Because you are founded on the revelation of who God is. But those that are founded on the revelation of just what God does. That's why I say, say back in Exodus, God said that to the people, He just showed them His ways. But with Moses, He showed him who He was. His, his ways, not His works. Many people will die in the wilderness who are just caught up in the works of God. But those that understand the ways of God will be strong when everybody else will shake. Which generation do you belong to? Can you stand to your feet? We'd just like to pray. Renew your mind in the word of God. Meditate on my word day and night. You meditate on your fears. You meditate on all the other things which are worthless. You can't change your tomorrow. But when you meditate on my word day and night, I will give you the wisdom to be able to impact your tomorrow. I know we've been speaking to different categories of people right now. But to everyone is the same word. He wants to move you from where you are so that he can move you to who you are. But that process, you've got to trust him. You've got to rely on him and say, God, you know. I don't understand because my mind is limited. My wisdom is limited. But I want to trust you, the author and the finisher of my faith. I want to trust you, my God of my yesterdays, my todays and my tomorrows. I want to trust you because you will never change. You're ever faithful. And I'm in the palm of your hand. And what he's saying to you, what he's challenging you, is would you leave your comfort and trust me to take you to the heights of your destiny? Would you trust me? Would you trust me? I don't want you to get stuck in the redemption zone. I want you to move into the restored zone. Israel is my people. I've called them to be a nation, but not everybody became a nation. The same people that I prophesied to, most of them died in the wilderness. But a few pressed on. You may be functional, but if you want to change your environment, you've got to move to effective. I have redeemed you. Now let me restore you. And I can only restore you through my word. Through my word, I will transform you. Through my word, I will equip you. Through my word, I will empower you. So that you will function in the position of your calling. I just want that word to just minister right now for just a few minutes into your heart and say, which generation do I belong to? Am I always on my knees seeking God for what I want? Or am I seeking God for who He is? That will tell you which generation you belong to. Where do I stand? 
the Bible says the word is like a mirror. It will reveal to you. It will show you who you are. It will show you what, what you are right now. But if you don't get into the word, if you don't see yourself according to the word of God, according to the standards of God, you will never be able to move forward to achieve what you really are meant to be. And it's the Father's heart is crying out and saying, I don't want you to die in the wilderness. I want you to reach your destiny. I want you to enter into the promised land. Thank you, Lord. You are ever faithful. You are ever faithful. You are ever faithful, Jehovah. Oh, yes, Lord. of you in my life I want to seek you for who you are Lord reveal to me Lord God is not a mystery to be hidden but a mystery to be revealed he wants to reveal himself he wants to reveal his heart and his ways and his thoughts he wants to reveal so much more in your life if you seek me with all your heart diligently seek me you will find me you will find me. You will find me. Father, I just want to thank you that you will continue to speak into our hearts and speak into our lives. That we be motivated, Father, to seek you more, to know you more, to immerse ourselves in you more, Lord. That we move away from the petty things that control us the things that occupy our mind and distract us help us to move away from that realm so that we can get a revelation of you Lord that is the cry of my heart I want to know you I want to know you in my life I want to know you in my life I want to know you, I want to know you. I want a deeper understanding, a deeper revelation of you, Lord. 
I want you, Lord. Hallelujah. Father, I just want to thank you one more time for this entire moment in your presence. The time of our praise and the worship and of our giving and the word. We thank you, Lord, that without your presence in this place, we are just wasting our time. So I thank you for your presence right here in this place. We thank you that you have spoken into the hearts of the people. We thank you, Lord, that you're challenging us to become who you called us to be. We thank you, Lord, for every hearer that has heard the word. Let the word take root in their life. And may you speak into their hearts and let it produce a fruit. And let the fruit remain for your glory and for your testimony, Lord. So I want to thank you for everyone that has come here this morning and everyone that's listening around the world. We speak a blessing on them. As we go forward to this week, we thank you that you've already gone ahead of us. We thank you that you've already created a way for us. We thank you for you've already provided for every need even before we ask or think or, or pray about it. You've already released it and we receive it right now in faith in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord, and we give you the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Can we give God a praise offering? Amen. Is there anybody, uh, is anybody celebrating their birthdays this week? Any birthday boys, girls this week? Can you come forward? We'd like to wish you. Nobody? Any wedding anniversaries? Check with your spouse. Wedding anniversaries? No? Okay, let's receive the blessing. Now unto him that is faithful, may his grace and his favor and his wisdom and his love continuously surround you and may his word transform you into the likeness and the calling and into the position that he has called you for. And may he and he alone receive all the grace, all the glory, all the testimony from your life. All the praise goes to him. The miracle worker, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. May he and he alone be exalted now and forevermore in your life. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a blessed week. Remember, Tuesday 7.30 we will meet. As you walk out, just greet somebody and just encourage them. And we shall, if you're waiting here for the second service, then we shall see you in the second service. God bless you.